ready and welcome to our weekly Zoom news conference. I'm Sandy Close, Director of Ethnic Media Services. Today, our briefing explores whether America can survive in a bubble while variants of COVID-19 rage elsewhere. Yesterday, the Centers for Disease Control advised Americans who are fully vaccinated that they could stop wearing masks in most settings, a clear sign the pandemic might be nearing an end. Yet much of the world is experiencing a surge in COVID infections. What are the risks for the US and what can we do about them? To address these questions, we are honored to have four distinguished speakers. Dr. Mark Lipsitch, Director of the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics at Harvard. Dr. Roseanne Guerra with the Federal University of Maranhão, Brazil. Dr. Ben Newman at Texas A&M University. And Peter May Barduk, an expert on the COVAX initiative to get vaccines to low income countries. We will send expanded bios of our speakers to all attendees along with a video of today's briefing this afternoon. I want to thank our interpreters, Oscar, Oscar Arteta and Jackie No, for providing simultaneous interpreting in Spanish and Korean. We ask our presenters to speak slowly for our interpreters. If you speak too fast, our moderator may interrupt to ask you to slow down. We invite reporters to please enter questions in the chat box. We will take questions for each speaker and again at the conclusion of the panel. I'm turning the conference over to today's moderator, Sunita Sarabji. Thank you, Sunita. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at this uh, very important briefing. We start with Dr. Uh, Mark Lipsitch. He is the uh, director of the Center for Communicable Diseases at Harvard. Dr. Uh, Lipsitch, welcome to the briefing. Thank you. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor and uh, to meet many new people. Um, I will um, speak about the situation in the United States, uh, I, not because I think the rest of the world is unimportant, but because that's my assignment. Um, and I will also say that I have, have a lot of opinions. Uh, I'm going to try to not go into the political opinions nearly as much as to try to give you background on the science. If people want to talk about what we should do about it, uh, I'm happy to do that, but I want to uh, my my relatively dry presentation will is not because I have no thoughts. It's because I'm trying to stick to the science for the yeah. open debate. Dr. Lipsitch, may I interrupt yeah. you? We welcome your uh, political opinions as well. Okay. So, well, I'm going to wait for those to be requested and and start with the start with the facts as I understand them. So, um, I I want to talk about the concept of herd immunity, um, which has been very much in the news. Uh, it was in the New York Times a few days ago in a big story, uh, and it's been really a, a very prominent subject. Um, and I think there are a lot of misunderstandings and misconceptions, uh, and I think it's kind of central to understanding what the situation is in the United States. Um, herd immunity is just the existence of people in a population who are immune, completely or partially immune, and who slow down transmission by making it harder for the virus to pass through them from one person to another. <clears throat> herd immunity is a fact. It's not a political, it's not a policy. It can be a name of a policy, but it's not really, uh, that, that's not where it came from. It's a fact, it's a thing that happens. It's happening now. Uh, that immunity is being created by infections and also by uh, vaccinations. And uh, there's been a lot of debate and discussion about, uh, well, there was a lot of, of policy debate about whether we should try to build it up through infections 
uh, or wait for vaccination, but we are now in a different phase of the pandemic in the United States. And so the real question that's on many people's minds is, will we reach a level of herd immunity uh, at which transmission becomes almost impossible uh, in any sustained way in the United States and where the virus essentially goes away? Uh, I've been saying since at least December that I think that's very unlikely, even with the vaccines that we have. And I would now modify my view to say I think it's pretty unlikely, at least for the country, but possible in certain pockets as we've gotten more information about the virus, I mean, about the vaccines. So let me explain why I think that and then why I think it's actually not the only important question. The, the, the point at which the virus can't transmit uh, in a sustained way is the point where each case doesn't even replace itself. It gives rise to less than one additional case. And we use the term reproductive number to describe the, the number of cases that each person infects. Sorry. Um, when the virus was new in a population, we estimated that the reproductive number before anyone stopped uh, stopped seeing each other and stopped uh, all of our interactions was around two and a half or three. Some people think it was higher in some places, and I agree with those people. I think it was probably four or five in some places, meaning each person was infecting four or five others. And so to get down to a point where with normal social behavior of the kind we had before the pandemic and with our masks off, um, we have to reduce transmission by a factor of four or five. Uh, and, and at least that because uh, that the variants have increased transmissibility, have increased the contagiousness. So if it was three before, as many people believe, it's now probably four and a half or five uh, just from the new variants. To get transmission down by a factor of five means immunizing four-fifths of the population so that what was five infections becomes one infection. And that's where the famous formula now that was once in textbooks that me and my four, four friends used to read and is now all over every newspaper is this formula of one minus one over the reproductive number. But that's all it, all it is. It's just a little bit of uh, arithmetic about that notion. So suppose for the rest of this discussion that we need to immunize 80% of the population. That means immunize them completely. That is, they have to be fully protected against the ability to transmit the virus. And the vaccines that we have probably uh, certainly protect to a, a large degree against transmitting the virus, but do not appear to be 100% protective. Uh, they're very good, but they're not 100%. And so the idea of trying to vaccinate, to, to, to fully immunize 80% of the population really means vaccinating more than 80% of the population. And given the levels of reluctance to, vac to, to get vaccine, the uh, continuing challenges of access, which I think is a flip side of the same problem, and, uh, and the fact that we are not vaccinating all of our population because children under 12 are not eligible. I think it's very unlikely that in a, as a nation in a uniform way, we will get to uh, whatever coverage is required of probably 85 or 90 percent. I think it's possible that in some places that will happen, um, in particular because children probably are less important in transmission. And so vaccinating them matters less than vaccinating adults. So all of these are, are very approximate numbers because there are so many moving parts. But that is the sort of uh, reason why the numbers have been sort of creeping up over time uh, in people's uh, talking about this and why it seems unlikely that we'll get all the way there throughout the United States. Um, a few thoughts about that. First of all, uh, what does it mean for the rest of our next few years. Well, it means that there will be some ongoing transmission of the virus. Um, I think 
if the trend from if, if yesterday's announcement from CDC is any kind of trendsetter, we will be allowing more and more transmission uh, from those who are not from from uh, people, uh, but trying to bring it down in turn with vaccination. So we'll, we'll the social barriers to transmission will be lower and the vaccine barrier will continue to grow, hopefully. Um, the critical thing, as I see it, is that we are, if we're not totally defeating the virus, we are in some, some sense defanging the virus, making it less dangerous uh, to have transmission. Uh, we have all sorts of viruses that transmit all the time and we don't shut down our society. Why? Why? Because they don't kill people in the same numbers and they don't uh, and they don't cause uh, the healthcare system to be overloaded, although seasonal flu sometimes gets close. So I think the, the likely scenario is that it'll be a quiet summer uh, and then uh, there will be a, some resurgence in the fall as the weather gets worse, people are inside more and we continue to lower our guard. But the, the hope is that if we can keep high enough vaccine coverage in the really vulnerable people, that will be a nuisance and will indeed be more than a nuisance for some, but that it, the scale of the damage will be much less. So increasing vac vaccination among the most vulnerable to me is really the remains the highest priority. There are also questions of variants becoming uh, escaping immunity. And I think that's a concern, but one that so far has not materialized dramatically in the United States. Uh, even though we have almost every variant in the world, some somewhere in the US, that has not yet at least become a problem. Um, and, uh, and there's also the question of how long immunity will last and whether revaccination will be necessary. And that remains uncertain. Um, I think then the other question is, should we be trying to get, how, how hard should we be trying to get to the uh, to the threshold and vaccinating every last person. Um, and here I will express an opinion, and this is an opinion. It's, you know, my opinion uh, in a democracy is just one of, of many equal opinions. So this is not because I'm a scientist, but just as a citizen, I share the view that was expressed by my close friends in the Washington Post yesterday or the day before two pediatricians who said, we have uh, been trying to vaccinate uh, um, every possible person in the United States and should continue to do so for those who are vulnerable, but that vaccinating young children in particular is a use of, vac of scarce vaccines that are much more needed many, many other places. Um, and while I think it's really hard for any individual to change our policy, uh, and I don't recommend that people forego vaccination for their children right now when they can get it, I do think that as a country we should be doing everything we can, including sharing vaccines before we immunize the lowest risk members of our population. But again, that's just a political view. Um, but it is a view informed by the, the wildly different levels of risk for a, uh, a high risk person in South Asia right now, for example, um, or many other parts of the world and a low risk child in the United States. So I'll stop there uh, and take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Lipsich. I wanted to ask you, first of all, there are a number of questions in the chat, but um, do you agree with the CDC's decision uh, yesterday to drop mask wearing for fully vaccinated people? Um, I actually would rather not comment on the CDC's decision. Uh, 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 I think I'll, I'll say I think it reflects a, a sensible reading of the science and it's it, it will have many challenges in implementation given that in the United States, your vaccine status is a private matter. Um, but I think I'm not going to comment further than that. Fair enough. Um, all right. Uh, first question comes from Pilar Marrero. Pilar. I'm trying to unmute. Here I am. Uh, hi, doctor. Thank you so much for that presentation. I've been getting a lot of pushback from my friends in Europe and other parts of the world saying that, you know, the U.S. is to blame for the fact that uh, vaccines that other countries and areas of the world cannot uh, get enough vaccine because the U.S. 
um, you know, started by, you know, making contracts, paying a higher price for the vaccine. Obviously, the U.S. invested a lot of money in them, too. But um, and and um, they hoarded some vaccine and and also chose chosen uh, chose to vaccinate lower risk people, which you just addressed. Um, do you agree with that? Do you think that our policy and here you should express an opinion. Do you think our policy has damaged other countries? Um, I, I think it's a complicated story. Um, certainly the US and other rich countries have bought up large supplies of vaccine more than enough, way more than enough to vaccinate our highest risk people. Um, uh, to be fair, we didn't know how good the vaccines were gonna be. Um, I think it would be hard to criticize an administration for trying to secure supplies when it can. Uh, I don't know many countries that would just say we don't we we want to let the rest of the world uh, have have it all together. Um, on the other hand, now that we are in a position where it is clear that um, vaccination of a substantial fraction of the population can bring transmission way down um, and reduce its consequences, I think. Uh, it's a there is a moral appeal to be made uh, and a self-interested appeal to the rich countries of the world and and I do include others besides the US uh, we are not the only ones that have bought lots of doses um, uh, that first of all uh, ongoing transmission at a high level in the rest of the world presents ongoing risks of new variants um, and probably even more to the point, ongoing transmission in the rest of the world, uh, putting aside the moral argument, is just bad for our our ability to live in this world. We like having uh, interactions with the rest of the world, and we've seen what an ongoing COVID epidemic can do to a country's ability to uh, to interact. And so, with commerce and with uh, culture and all the all the reasons why we value the rest of the world, we should uh, we should value their health as well, um, quite apart from the moral argument. So I think I think there are many arguments to be made now that we see what the vaccines can do with a certain amount of coverage. Dr. Lipsich, there are a number of questions for you in the chat, but uh, to keep with our timeline, I'm going to move on to the next speaker. Thank you so much for joining us today. Sure. Very much appreciated. We uh, move on to Dr. Uh, Rosan Guerra, who is joining us from Brazil, from the University of Maranhão. And uh, correct me if I pronounced it uh, incorrectly. Dr. Guerra, welcome. Could you tell us about the situation in Brazil? Uh, hello, thank you for the invitation. Uh, our situation is not good. It's at this moment, uh, I still a little bit in control, but uh, the vaccination, I suppose that it is the only solution. At now, we don't have any medication to, to prevent or to control the worst, uh, worst uh, symptoms of, of this disease. And despite the precedent uh, speed of vaccine development against COVID, uh, the problem is the variants. And when we have a lot of people infect every day, and in Brazil we have, uh, uh, together with India, the high levels in the world. So the possibility to have new variants is increased every day. And now we have uh, identified by CDC and by the World Health Organization only for variants that have uh, that are important in the for the, the public health, but it's possible to have another variant, and so it's necessary also to make uh, uh, to control this and to to evaluate uh, the, this possibility and to test every every day people about the possibility to have new variants. And at now we know, for example, for the Brazilian variant P1, uh, the CoronaVac, the vaccine most used in Brazil, and AstraZeneca also uh, are, are effective in control this the, the dissemination of this variant. 
And as I know, uh, Pfizer vaccine also, but Pfizer vaccine only uh, uh, began in Brazil uh, this month, this week, in, in fact. And the greatest, greatest risk in the world, as Dr. Lipstick has uh, taught, is the slow uh, vaccination, because this is the only solution we have at now. And in Brazil, we have also uh, some political problems because our president don't believe this is a, a severe situation. And every time, every day, they, they, uh, they, 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 they claim people to go outside, to not use the masks, to, in fact, uh, to use uh, uh, unsuccessful drugs to control the disease. And this is the right risk, and the, the, it's also the cause of a great number of deaths. And another, another thing that is interesting in Brazil is the uh, Manaus situation, the Amazonic situation, because uh, at the end of uh, last year, around 70% of people in Manaus are positive for, for SARS-CoV-2. But in December and January, a new wave begins in this, this region. And uh, this, this wave is supposed to be related to the presence of a P1. And again, it's, this variant is important to reinfection. And we have no data about the, the capacity to, to provoke death. But uh, if it's possible to make reinfection, this is a, a, a great problem, I suppose, too. Uh, another question is the, uh, the possibility to have another emerging variant in Rio, because uh, four variants are detected over there. One is the, the, African, the South African variant, but Three other are never identified before, and so they are under study at now to investigate how, how dangerous it may be and if they are able to be uh, controlled by the vaccination and the vaccines used in Brazil. Uh, so I, I prepare only six minutes, and so I have much things to, to take to, to talk about, but. Uh, 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 concerning the immunological system, the P1 uh, variant is more vascular than the, the, uh, the, other, the other lineage. And uh, at now in Brazil, more than 50 percent uh, is caused by this variant. And this variant is also present in several countries in the South America as well as in United States, Canada, France, Portugal, and all this country at now have closed their borders from Brazilian people. And this is a great problem. And answer the question of this meeting, my, my answer is no. It's not possible to have a bubble in a country because only if the citizens of this country cannot move to another, another country or another uh, city. It's, it's impossible to have a, a bubble in, at this moment because we have a globally, uh, a globally population. And so people fly from one place to another so easily. And we have to close our borders, every border to control the diseases. I suppose that it's not reasonable. And thank you for the invitation. And so uh, some I'm, I'm expect some questions. Yes, um, Dr. Guerra, what are you seeing in the countries around Brazil? Are you seeing the same level of intensity as you're seeing in your own country? No, unfortunately, only Brazil has, unfortunately or fair, uh, fortunately, only Brazil has uh, these high, high levels of new cases and deaths. Still now we have a, a slow, a slow uh, number, uh, a decreasing number of deaths, but the number of new cases are still high. 
and Argentina and Paraguay and Uruguay, uh, they have controlled the disease. And so I, I don't know why, but I suppose that it's also a genetic implication, a, a high genetic implication in this disease because we can see that uh, there is a family when father, mother and sons and daughters die uh, with this disease and the others and no, no effects in, at all. Absolutely. Last week, we had a special briefing on India, and uh, the speaker spoke about uh, a great shortage of uh, uh, supplies, oxygen, uh, beds, uh, protective equipment, etc. Is that the same um, sort of impact that you are seeing in uh, Brazil, particularly in Ma Manaus, where, uh, which you uh, spoke about earlier? Yes, we have the same, the same thing in Manaus. But uh, it's, it's a political problem because we have a, a general on the, the Minister of Health and he didn't know everything about health. And also the people that, that follow him or work over there uh, don't have any, any uh, don't have uh, knowledge about the, the situation and don't want to, to take some problems that can resolve this. And why, it's why also because the P1 is, is overspread on, on our country because several patients and families from Manaus come from other states to be uh, in the hospital because over there, there is no place for them. And so the P1 come, come with them, but we have no way to, to, to deal with this and no other way to deal with this. Absolutely. There is a question from Henrietta Burroughs. Henrietta? Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, she's coming on. Just uh, give her one second. Yes. Oh, Henrietta, okay, can thank you. Unmute you. yourself? Uh, has there been any sizable pushback to the president of Brazil's policies? Um, and didn't he? Sorry? Has, has there been any opposition, sizable opposition to the president's? policies towards the virus? And didn't he at one point get the virus himself? Yes, he gets the virus, but with the, with the mild sign, symptoms. And so we, at now, he forced the, the, his idea that it's not, a, it's a small flu and not a, a severe disease. And uh, the opposition at now, uh, uh, makes a, a kind of uh, a commission to investigate the, 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 the health policy of this government. And so it's found that, for example, the Pfizer vaccine uh, may be uh, used in, in, in our country since December if we have a good minister of health. And in fact, our vaccination begins only in January. We have a potent, uh, a potent health system that it's uh, uh, a public health system, but this government makes some, some wrong decisions that uh, make this system don't work well to control the pandem pandemic. One quick question before we move on to Dr. Newman. What percentage of the Brazilian population has been vaccinated since uh, January, since you rolled out in January? Around 17 around around 17 one seven it's so little okay one seven yes it's so thank little you, thank you so much for joining thank us you. dr dara very much appreciated okay um, thank you for the invitation yes you take care we move on uh next to dr ben newman he is the chief virologist at the Global Health Research Complex at Texas A&M University. Welcome, Dr. Newman. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. So I suppose my perspective will be a little different than some of the other speakers because I don't come from the world of medicine or the world of epidemiology. I come from virology. We study the virus and do our best to try to understand this little thing. Uh, based on this, I, I think that is very much what informs my opinions. Um, I think we can start by saying that I absolutely agree 
bubbles are beautiful and bubbles do not last long in this world. Uh, and I think any vaccine bubble which may exist is going to be fragile, unfortunately. We know that immunity wanes. And we know from the limited studies that exist that there's a certain rate at which B cells, T cells, and antibodies will decrease over time. But we don't know exactly what is the point where a person would be no longer protected. We only know that it is a matter of time. And so I would argue against any of the partial solutions. I think the only way out is a single global solution. And that would be quite literally vaccinating everyone and not just vaccinating them, but vaccinating them within a particular window. The window may be six months, it may be a year, but this is the challenge. And this is opinion rather than fact, but I've seen what the world can do. When we fight each other, something like World War II is pretty nearly maximum human effort toward one particular goal. And um, yeah, I, I don't think halfway solutions are going to get us there, but I feel as though we have enough vaccines and they work surprisingly well that uh, probably there is a way out of this. We just have to take it collectively and not in small groups or vulnerable groups or in partial measures as we have done up to this point. Um, so I think I am here because I have been sequencing some of the viruses in this part of Texas and this part is really unremarkable. We have cases and before we sequenced, we had no idea exactly what strains there were. We knew some of the common strains from other parts of the world, but we did not know what was here locally. What we found was a lot of different variants. Several of these were new variants. And I think more and more as people start to read out more of these genomes, we will see that the virus is changing in unexpected ways. And I know at least some degree of vaccine hesitancy in this country is based on trust or lack of trust. But at the same time, I think I trust the virus less a snake, a chicken, a cat, you can trust to act in its own best interest to the best of its ability. A virus has uh, no such impulse. We learned from a preprint last week that some of the enzymes that cause blood clotting uh, to happen, the last and next to last enzymes in that cascade, also are fairly effective at activating the coronavirus so that it can infect. And in that paper, they also showed that this causes more infection, which yields more virus. This is unfortunately an evolutionary incentive, if you like, although viruses would not understand incentives. But this is an evolutionary pressure, which may drive the virus not in the direction we would hope or expect, um, but in the direction of more severe disease or more sustained disease. And just because the process of viral evolution and evolution in general is inherently unpredictable, I don't think, yeah, I, I really dislike the way that this has been handled up to now. And I think the last thing I would say is that Oddly, at the moment, what I'm seeing is the most reluctance from people with proximity to the solutions and the most desire for the solutions from people who are farthest away. And I think that's a terrible thing. And uh, yeah, there are many ways to rectify it, but uh, choosing one would be very nice and pursuing it as hard as possible. I think that's probably enough of me if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Absolutely. Dr. Newman, what are some of the um, variants of concern that uh, the World Health Organization has identified as a particular concern? And have you seen them in your own sequencing? 
Yeah, the interesting thing from our sequencing is that we've been sequencing over time. So we've got 11 weeks worth of uh, variant sequences. And what we saw in January, which is when uh, we were very near the peak, uh, the most recent peak here in Texas, was that we had about 30% variants of concern. And almost all of that was the um, UK variant B117. By the time we get to late April and early May, this has shifted. And we are now in a situation where every single virus we have picked up in the last three weeks has been one of these variants of concern. And I think when a lot of people make the calculation as to whether or not they should take precautions or get vaccinated, they're thinking of the original versions of the virus and uh, yeah, at least in this particular place and time, there is approximately a 100% chance that you will run into something that grows faster and has the potential to spread farther and perhaps hit harder than uh, one would be expecting otherwise. Absolutely. Could um, Dr. Uh, I'm sorry, Henrietta Burroughs has a question for you. Henrietta. It's a good question, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I can read it if you like. Um, it seems that the virus is acting in its own best interest by replicating. Yes, I would agree. Um, infecting as many as possible and not killing everyone. So how is it that it's not acting in its own best interest? The virus is not one thing. What we've seen so far is that certain lineages of the virus have driven other lineages of the virus out of existence. Um, many of the early lineages are now completely extinct and you can only find them in a laboratory. And we're seeing an increase in viral fitness. It's a very Darwinian uh, process. It's hard for me as a biologist to see it any other way. But the thing is, there's not necessarily any check or balance on the virus. It is operating on about a six to eight hour timetable. That's the time it takes to go in and then come back out. And yeah, with that sort of short term risk reward cycle, I don't know that you can necessarily predict long term movement in a particular direction, I would say. So I like the logic and I would hope that the virus would obey that logic. And there are cases where it certainly has. I simply don't think we can rely on the virus to do that. And I don't think that is our best um, uh, solution. Dr. Guerra asked a question uh, of you, and this is a question that I also had for you. Do you suppose we will have to revaccinate every year? Will we need those boosters every year? At a minimum, every At year. Minimum. Yeah. Um, the question is, will we need additional ones depending on how the virus varies? Because although each of the vaccines is still reasonably effective against all the variants, there is definitely a lower effectiveness against some. Uh, the 484 variants like you see coming out of uh, Brazil and South Africa, for example. And given time, the virus will continue to vary and very unpredictably. And so I think our solutions will have to be updated and it may be the virus changing more than waning immunity that drives the vaccination cycle. Absolutely. Could I ask may, a question? May I address that one also? Sorry? May I address that one also? I have a different yeah. perspective. Absolutely. <laughs> Please come in. Thanks. Um, so I, I agree that there's a very strong possibility of that annual or more vaccination will be routine, at least in some countries. I think there's also a, a, a another possibility, which I'm curious if Dr. Newman agrees, which is that um, it was laid out as a sort of hypothesis in a modeling paper in science recently by Rustam Antia and Jenny Levine. And that, that idea is that immunity will be short-lived to transmission, and so transmission will continue if we don't vaccinate all the time, but that if immunity to severe disease is longer lasting, then we will have a population in whom we just don't care that much about transmission. Um, because unlike in a pandemic where there are a lot of people who have reached age 70 or 80 and never had this virus before, 
by the time people reach 70 or 80, they will have had it in their 60s or their 50s several times and, uh, and won't be as, uh, as at risk. And so it's possible that we would find a much more relaxed vaccination strategy as possible uh, and even desirable given the cost and, and resources required. Dr. Newman, do you want to respond to that or? Sure, I can try. That <laughs> is a good point. And I do like that idea, but uh, in another sense, I don't, I don't know that we can expect it. We've underestimated as a world, not even as America, but we've underestimated the virus over and over and over. We have relaxed restrictions, seen the virus surge back up, and maybe one time we'll be right. We'll relax at the right time and things will go our way. But generally the question that I get asked the most is can we do the wrong thing but still expect the right results? <laughs> and I just, yeah, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't seem the most likely, yeah. Could I ask you the same question that I asked Dr. Lipsich? Um, do you agree with the CDC's decision to um, uh, allow unvaccinated people or vaccinated people to uh, be massless? I don't think that is the path that leads to the fastest extinction of the virus. But I know the CDC are actually trying to do a lot of different things with what they're doing. And so I believe they're trying to take a big picture, whereas I would take a very narrow, very small picture view of this thing. Yeah. What would you say specifically? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Get the vaccine, wear a mask. And when the numbers go down, then you know it's safe to relax. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much. And we will move on to our next speaker. There are so many questions in the chat, and I'm hoping that uh, perhaps you will answer some of these questions. And... Um, we next move on to Peter Maybarduk. He is the Director of Public Citizens Access to Medicines Group. Uh, Peter, welcome to the call. It's great to be with you. I hope to talk a little bit about sharing doses and then some more about sharing knowledge and how we increase global vaccine production to deal with uh, some of the problems that have been identified by other speakers. I was asked to talk about COVAX a little bit COVAX, of course, is the Global Vaccine Equity Initiative. It's really the only game uh, in town uh, for sharing vaccines equitably worldwide. It is an initiative. It's part of the ACTA Accelerator Program with the World Health Organization and uh, partnered with Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, Major Vaccine Procurer, and CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, which is sort of a startup funder for many vaccine candidates. Uh, work of COVAX, of course, quite essential at this moment. Its target is to vaccinate essentially 20% of the world, uh, preferably this year, 2 billion dose target for this year with two major streams. A, a one stream for self-financed countries, wealthy countries that essentially buy in to the COVAX pool because that way they get access to a broader portfolio of vaccines than they could necessarily purchase on their own. Gavi at COVAX has access to many vaccines. If you're a wealthy country and you buy in, you can vaccinate some percentage of your people with any of those vaccines, depending on which ones actually wind up proving uh, safe and effective. COVAX also serves 92 advanced market commitment countries, low and middle income countries that are looking for some way into the scrum, some way to get doses given that wealthy countries are purchasing doses in, in bulk uh, bilaterally and, and eating up much of the global supply. WHO emergency use authorization is required for distribution of vaccines through COVAX. So far, five vaccines, I believe, have that authorization. Pfizer, AstraZeneca, J&J, &J, Moderna, and recently Sinopharm out of China. Uh, but so far, COVAX has only been able to ship 64 million doses. For perspective, that's about one quarter of the doses that have been administered already in the United States alone. It's hardly enough doses for even one of the world's larger middle-income countries, let alone 92 countries. Uh, COVAX, of course, while well, it's the, the vaccine equity initiative, countries are all over the world purchasing what they can in, and making arrangements with 
uh, Russia for Sputnik and China for Sinopharm and Sinovac and other vaccines. Uh, and of course, purchasely, purchasing directly from the Western uh, originators as well, leading so far to about 340 million people fully vaccinated uh, worldwide. It's less than 5% of the world's population. So we have a very long way to go. But we do expect rapid increases. This is obviously, it's, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's a really impressive accomplishment that we have vaccines Peter, as quickly. Peter, I'm sorry, just a bit slower for our interpreters. My apologies, yes, no of course. Um, I can, anything that was missed, I can repeat um, at the end. It's reasonable to expect significant increases from this time, but nowhere near as much uh, in production volume, but nowhere near as much as is needed. We see estimates put out that perhaps there will be 10, uh, 10 billion doses at the end of this year. We see reason to be uh, skeptical or at least concerned about that, not bet on that figure, because as we've seen, for example, COVAX so far is actually uh, quite, quite a bit behind. You have the challenges in the world's largest manufacturing vaccine uh, facilities um, out of India, export controls as a result. It's true that the United States is prioritizing its own access to raw materials, which makes it harder for producers abroad to put vaccines online as quickly as they would like. Some vaccines will have trouble meeting, uh, or some uh, companies may have trouble meeting regulatory requirements and demonstrating safety and efficacy in different countries. Developing countries for manufacturers, for example, will still need to work with the WHO to get qualification for their facilities. There isn't necessarily an easy pathway. It takes time. And even places like the United States, you're seeing disasters like that at the emergent facility in Baltimore making the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, slowing production estimates here. So we see reason to be, uh, to uh, I think to echo Dr. Newman's point, we, we, should not, we should not just cross our fingers and assume that uh, all is going to work out. Billions more doses are needed, and we think it's critically important to urgently increase manufacturing capacity to get to that point. For those of you, Sunita had mentioned that some of you are sort of interested in understanding when countries will get, when various countries will get certain access. I've posted in the chat the UNICEF tracker that does this as best as possible in real time for which countries have received how many doses, what has been allocated, what's already in transit or has been delivered. Um, COVAX has an algorithm for processing, uh, for, for deciding who gets doses first. The goal is equitable distribution worldwide, but of course, shipments still go somewhere first. Ghana got vaccines, Vietnam has not yet. Uh, they will be on their way, but the, the point is that the volume is going to be too low everywhere. So while we're talking about, um, the, other, the issue with uh, sharing doses, of course, is that only you or I can take any given dose. But I think part of our perspective is that all of the world can benefit from the knowledge that's embedded in any given dose. We can share that knowledge, the know-how to make vaccines freely and help increase global capacity without delaying vaccinations in any given country. For those of us who have been working on this foreseeable vaccine shortfall, since the beginning of the pandemic, I think that it also has been clear that of course, politicians who are nationally accountable are going to focus on vaccinating their own people first. That's not ideal. We support the WHO's equitable allocation framework, but I think in the world of realpolitik, we all need to understand that that is going to happen. And the question is how to accelerate the sharing, not only of doses, but also of raw materials and fundamentally of the, the knowledge and capacity to make vaccines as quickly as possible. So what needs to happen? Clearly, COVAX needs to be uh, fully funded. There is still a shortfall. Tedros, the WHO Director General, will talk about a $20 billion for shortfall for the WHO's overall effort the, the numbers for the COVAX vaccine pillar are, are smaller, but there's still extra funding needed. Nevertheless, absent new manufacturing, many of the world's people may not be vaccinated, we believe, until 2023, if ever. The latter point is important also because it's not the case that there is a plan from national leaders anywhere to vaccinate everyone everywhere. 
That plan does not exist. There are hopeful dose projections that in two years time, we'll be dealing with enough doses to reach everyone. Even so, it's not clear that the incentives or the health service delivery really uh, lines up. And so what you hear from advocates like us now is we need that plan. We need that plan to get vaccine to everyone everywhere. The UN Secretary General on Wednesday called for doubling the world's vaccine supply. Um, I know we're short on time, but I was asked to address the TRIPS waiver that made so much news last week when the United States government announced that it would support the, um, the sharing of intellectual property or at least the lifting of World Trade Organization restrictions on intellectual property for vaccines uh, for the duration of the pandemic. A little bit on what that can do and what that can't do. We think that's a, a critically important uh, development uh, in part for what it does for the politics. The US government and many wealthy governments have been very hesitant to act ambitiously for a global response. And what we have seen between the attention of the TRIPS waiver and the crisis in India in recent weeks is national leaders, including in the United States, starting to turn that corner and starting to be willing to talk about uh, the world's problems and not just the national problems. It's, it's been reported, we understand that the highest level decision makers in the White House, for example, they are afraid to get out ahead of American zone concerns and talk about the problem in the rest of the world, right? Which is part of why we talk about sharing not just doses, but knowledge and fueling increased production capacity that can benefit everyone everywhere. So the TRIPS waiver, lifts patent restrictions, but of course, to make vaccines, you need not only access to what's in the public domain, to the public information of patents, you need access to vaccine recipes, to confidential information, to process chemists and engineers that are active at the facilities. So what we and, and others have called for is a combined significant investment in urgent manufacturing capacity and a whole of government effort kind of a warp speed for the world, if you want to think about it in US terms, to share technology uh, with the world, to provide technical assistance and through new resources, set up new production lines. It is our analysis with Imperial uh, College uh, engineers that it's possible to produce 8 billion doses of mRNA vaccine within a year and make up the global shortfall if we significantly invest and the investment required could be $25 billion. It's not a small amount of money. However, it is quite small compared to the economic damage of the pandemic and of delayed vaccination, which is estimated eight, $9 trillion potentially over, over the course of the next couple, uh, couple of years. I know that I've taken time, so I should probably wrap up and, and leave it for any questions, but um, our sense is that this, can be done and what is most needed is sort of a, a catalog to catalyze political leadership from wealthy countries to think differently. When we talk to the technical experts at the World Health Organization or in the US government and elsewhere who are trying to bring more vaccine production capacity online, they will say the challenge is we don't know where the capacity is. It's hard to just turn it on. But the issue is that they're working on existing resources. They don't have instantly funds or personnel to send and say, get this done. And COVAX on its own, the World Health Organization doesn't have the power to sit down with Pfizer and say, here's what you're going to do. But we believe that President Biden and other leaders do. And if they activate, then you get a different kind of production on a different kind of time scale. As, as Dr. Newman, I believe was saying, it's if we think of true mobilizations like World War II, we have to be thinking that kind of everyone all together in production capacity. Whereas so far what we've been doing is giving very significant and important grants to companies uh, to pursue sort of their own trajectory. That, uh, that is useful to a point, but to get to the next stage, it needs to be a much more integrated effort. It looks quite doable to us, but it's a political decision that has to be made. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, I wanted to ask uh, the question to Dr. Lipsidge, Dr. Newman, and Dr. Guerra. Do you also support um, uh, uh, implementing waivers on intellectual property for vaccines? 
Uh, I don't know. I, I think so, but I have also heard uh, a lot of uh, compelling arguments that the that the other issues of knowledge sharing are make the TRIPS waiver by itself a relatively weak uh, lever, so that because the know-how doesn't transfer with it. So I think uh, it I doesn't feel to me from what little I know, like uh, a sufficient um, action. Dr. Newman? Uh, oh, I suppose that, sorry. It, it, oh, sorry. <laughs> Please go on. Uh, <laughs> I suppose that it depends uh, uh, how much money each government invest in this in this uh, initiative because it's a quite quite complicated question because the the enterprise have to survive and so it's uh, it's hard it's hard to to decide so and dr newman i, I think i would agree with uh, dr lipsich uh, i don't know that it's enough I would say that it may be a good first step though. And once again, my worldview is very, very simplistic, but uh, that would align with uh, what I think would end the pandemic soonest. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to turn the uh, briefing back to Sandy Close for any final remark and any final questions that you might have, Sandy. I am, I am excited to absorb all this information. Two questions came from the interpreters. And again, it's so important that we have them on this call. One is about the percent of people in Manaus who were infected. And the figure is 70, uh, not 17. It's easy to miss here. Uh, the second is, uh, what is the trip? You referred to the trip waiver what the interpreters do, do not know what that reference is yes sorry i went very quickly so this is a waiver of until a temporary suspension of world trade organization rules that govern intellectual property for all the member countries which is almost all all the world so the waiver says that countries are free to not worry about the WTO, to not worry about the international patent rules now for the dirt, or well, would be free if the waiver is approved, to experiment with manufacturing, to import technologies, uh, and to find their own way through the pandemic. But the points that have been made are, are true. So I, I see the waiver in part in political terms. I think it, it helps shift power, change the conversation, create more of a global focus. It's true that you need more than that waiver to produce vaccines. Thank you. Uh, so TRIP refers to trade? Yes, it's the, it's the trade related aspects of intellectual property. It's an acronym. It's an words. acronym okay. in, uh, in the World Trade Organization. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, all, many of us are uh, really in a very steep learning curve and this was a tremendous contribution to moving forward and also to being able to cover this issue. Uh, there were so many wonderful references uh, throughout your presentations. I don't, I, I guess I have too many questions and it, the hour is up, but I wish if you could, if any of you of our speakers see questions in the chat box we couldn't get to that you wouldn't mind answering. That would be a tremendous uh, favor to all of us. I want to thank you, Sunita, thank you. Uh, this was just tremendous and we hope you guys will come back again and give us an update in a couple of months. Thank you so much.